Following is an interview with Mary Strahan Ritter, who taught speech at Modesto High School from 1950 to 1976. It's being recorded at her home in Phoenix, Arizona on the 20th of September, 1997. She is 82 years old. We're doing this at the behest of Donovan Cummings, former president and current historian of the California High School Speech Association. Mother, I understand uh, from looking at these clippings that are 60 years old from the uh, Sioux Falls, South Dakota High School um, speech and some college information here as well that um, you look gorgeous there. How did you get involved in the speech program? It seems you must have won an awful lot of things here. Oratory, extent, debate. Well, sort of indirectly, 66 years ago, it was uh, during my sophomore year at Washington High School in Sioux Falls that I decided to go out for oratorical interp. I don't remember why, but I did. And I didn't win anything that I remember, but apparently somebody said, hey, she's got some possibilities. So the vice principal of the school uh, stopped me in the hall one day and he said, why didn't I try out for extemp? Well, I didn't know what that was, but he explained briefly, and I went off to the library and I studied for about an hour on the Crown Colony of India. And then I showed up for the contest that evening, and lo and behold, I got one topic. It was not the Crown Colony of India. I don't remember exactly what it was, but I believe it was about prohibition, which we were having some trouble with back in 1931. So then they locked me in a classroom for an hour with no books, no magazines, no paper or pencil that I recall. At the end of the hour, I came out, gave a speech that lasted, I think, three minutes, and I thought I had the solution to this problem, believe me. I didn't win, but again, somebody thought, well, she's got possibilities, I think. So they said, why don't you try out for debate? Well, if you think that first experience on extent was bad enough, where do you hear this? In debate, you had to try out to get into the debate class. So we were explained briefly what debate was all about and how long the uh, speeches lasted and told what the topic was for the year, and we studied on our own, and so lo and behold, we tried out, and surprise, surprise, I got into the debate class. The last two years that I was at Washington High School in Sioux Falls, I was a debater, an extemporer, an orator, what have you. And at the very tail end of my senior year at Washington High, we joined the National Forensic League so that I could say that I was a student member of NFL. Now, we were one of the earliest schools to join that organization, which had started in Ripon, Wisconsin in 1925. I went from there to Augustana College in Sioux Falls again, but it was a school that has a powerhouse in competitive speech. It was well known. It was a member of Pi Kappa Delta, which was the largest collegiate speech organization in the United States at the time. There were some smaller ones for junior colleges, and there was one that belonged to sort of the Big Ten, you know? The rest of us all belonged to Pi Kappa Delta. And Augustana used to compete with Redlands, California for the top dog place in that organization. In fact, the province of the Sioux, which was a part of the Pi Kappa Delta organization, was one of the strongest speech organizations in the United States at the time. Well, for four years, I was a participant in debate, extemp, oratory, I went to the Nationals in Lexington, Kentucky as a freshman in 1934. <laughs> I had to think a minute there. I went to the Pro province tournament in 1935. I went to the Nationals in Houston, Texas in 1936. And a little sidebar here. I learned many years later that a fellow named Ernie Poletti, who spoke, who 
taught speech for 40 years at Rippon and Tracy had also been at that tournament in 1936. And then we had the Province of the Sioux my last year, and that was a really stellar year for me in debate. We won many, many different tournaments, having won a high ranking at, not at Houston the year before. And I capped off my collegiate career, I guess you could say, by taking second place at the Interstate Oratorical Contest held at Northwestern University every year for many, many years. This was supposed to be somewhat nationwide in scope, although all of, all of the states did not belong to it. And that year I'd also taken a first in extemp at the province of the Sioux, and a first in oratory at the state, and so on. So that about ends it up, I guess, in my speech experiences in high school and college. Well, now in college, you actually majored in math and minored in physics and speech. Uh, did you go on later to do further training in speech? Oh, yes, I did, eventually. I had to earn a little money. It was 1940 when I finally got to the University of Iowa. I'd actually been awarded a half scholarship to Northwestern. But, you know, this was the Depression years, and it cost more to go back to Evanston, Illinois, a suburb of Chicago, than it did to go to Iowa City. So that's where I went uh, in 1940. And did you complete your training there? No, I was interrupted. It was a long time later in University of Oregon, after World War II, when I completed it on the GI Bill. I ended in 1950. And in those intervening years, then, you had um, been in the Army, uh, met and married your husband, and had two children, and also taught for uh, a number of years in various places. Did you always teach speech? Oh, I always was a competitive speech director. As a matter of fact, the first year I taught school, I even had letterhead stationery with my name as the debate coach. It's the only school that ever gave me that sort of treatment, but back in Flanders, South Dakota, in 1937, that's what I had. Uh, the only other school in Flanders, which was a very small place, was a Sioux Indian school, and the superintendent used to commit to giving speeches out at the Sioux Indian school, and then he wouldn't want to go, and he'd call me and say, hey, Mary, would you go and give a speech to the assembly? And of course, that's what I would do. And you taught there, and then you went uh, back to your alma mater in Sioux Falls? I taught in Flandreau two years, and then went back to, to Washington High School in Sioux Falls. And in 1940, I think it's interesting to note that I took a debate team and an individual entry to the national NFL tournament held that year in Terre Haute, Indiana. And they put us up in, in private homes, which I think is interesting. Can you imagine doing that today? Not likely. And then from there, um, you went into the Army during World War II. Well, uh, before that, before World War II, I had really come to the conclusion that I needed to do something besides coach speech. And at, at, at Washington High, I was so busy before school, during lunch, after school, evening, day after day, weekend after weekend, and I finally got to the point where I was even coaching on Sunday afternoon. And that last year that I was there, I actually coached groups that went to four different tournaments on one weekend, and I had to get other teachers to cart the three of them, of the groups, to their destination, because I couldn't split myself into four. And I thought, there has to be more to life than this. So I quit teaching. And then I went to St. Paul, Minnesota, and I was there at the time of Pearl Harbor and the following spring when the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps got started, I applied and I was selected for the very first company, which met on the 20th of July, 1942 in Fort Des Moines, Iowa. And following the war, then you went back to teaching? Well, yes, uh, I did eventually. But in the interim, my husband had been sent to Alaska again, 
And I flew up there where I had my second child. I'd flown home from Europe to have my first, Susan, who, by the way, is the one who is interviewing me here. And both she and my son, Bob, were members of my speech squad in the early 60s, and I have to say that they did very well. We didn't have any choice. I didn't have any choice. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm trying to get you back from Alaska to South Dakota, where you taught for a while. Oh, right. I came back from Alaska because my husband had been hospitalized and sent back, and I came back alone with a son who was four months old at the time in a clothes basket, and my daughter who was not quite two years old. And I had to find some work to do, and so lo and behold, I applied and I got a job teaching at Southern State Teachers College, which is down on the lower of Missouri, in the bottom end of South Dakota. And there I had a woman who took first in women's extent at the state, and a man who took first in oratory at the state, and who went on to uh, compete at that interstate oratory contest that I spoke of in Northwestern. It was ten years from the time I had been there. And from there you went to Oregon, uh, to Hermiston. I understand you started the speech program there? Yes, I did. They did not have one until I arrived, and I started it, and it was successful enough that we had a first place in state in uh, boys' oratory and a third place in after-dinner speaking. It was after that that I went finally to Eugene, to the University of Oregon, and completed my master's on the GI Bill, 1950. And it was after that that you moved to California. We'll leave that for the next segment. Um, teaching, and as I understand it, you were recruited um, on the advice of the head of the speech department at the University of Oregon to teach at Modesto High School. And I myself remember that long train ride uh, when we moved down. What was the speech department like at Modesto High when you got there? What did you find? Well, I found that uh, the coach who had been there for 30 years, Margaret Painter, had retired two years earlier, 1948, and the young man who replaced her was fired in mid-year, uh, a year and a half later. Consequently, they had a substitute for the balance of the year, and things went downhill from there, I guess. By the time I arrived, there were only four students who had NFL membership, and none of them had one that was higher than honor. So there was really not much of a squad left for me, and I remember distinctly that on the back of an envelope were scribbled the names of about a half a dozen to a dozen names for people who would come to judge. And that's what I inherited. Uh, <laughs> not too auspicious. However, early in the fall, I think I, school had hardly opened, when George Lorbeer, who was the coach for years and years and years at Lowell High School in San Francisco, and who was the current NFL district chairman, had a meeting uh, in San Francisco that I went to, and it was probably there that I met Betty Perkins from Merced, who was one of the powerhouse coaches of our area. The other person who was there at the time, but who was not NFL, I don't think they ever did join NFL, was Ernie Poletti, who was at Ripon. And aside from that, I don't remember too many others than the immediate area. I did meet Carmendale Fernandez that year at my speech tournament, and I don't know whether she was NFL at that time. I don't know whether I met her at, in San Francisco. <laughs> I do remember her coming to my speech tournament, however, and sitting on a student's desk, and she called me long distance and said, could I put her students up in the homes? And I recruited homes for her students to stay in, and since she lived in Turlock, which was a short distance away, we took care of her whole troop. <laughs> now, the trouble with the situation in Northern California in 1950 was that the only league was the Northern California NFL. 
and not too many schools belong to that. Modesto High School had joined in 1931. Obviously, Lowell High School was a part of it, and I don't, and I think Merced must have been, but I don't know uh, who else was involved. Now, as a result of this, any school that wanted to host a speech tournament went ahead and chose the events that that coach wanted to offer, decided on the rules, decided on the time limits, decided on everything, sent out vol voluminous invitations, and I mean there were pages and pages because you had to explain everything. And that first year I sent out to well over a hundred schools in Northern California, all over Northern California. And the, one of the troubles was that there was sort of unlimited entry and no worry about conflict of interest, you know, being in two things at the same time, etc. So it meant that generally there was chaos. You had one tournament where the time limit on original oratory would be 10 minutes. Next time you went out to somebody else's tournament, it would be eight. The next time out one year, I think it was six. And that can be a little frustrating. Now the state tournament at that time was run by two college uh, coaches. The Redlands coach in the south and what was then COP in the north decided uh, what events would be offered, decided the rules, decided the time limits, decided how it would be uh, handled for state quality, and did all of that. And they put out the information so late in the year that it was extremely frustrating. My first year there, I thought we would never learn what was going to be offered at state or what the rules were going to be. I think it was the end of February before we ever got anything. Then, that first year, we went to COP for the state qual. And I remember distinctly that I had 17 people entered in oratorical interp alone let alone any other event. But that number just sticks with me. Then they had these huge panels, eight to ten people in a panel, one judge, only the people who got first or second from that one judge would go on to the next round. Well, you can see why I thought things needed improvement. Because here we had all kinds of people who'd come to a tournament, lasted one round, and sat around the rest of the time. Things came to a head, sort of, in 1952, my second year. And we were at um, COP again, at the state qualifying. And we were dissatisfied enough with a very cheap, sleazy, small uh, awards that were being given out. I had one student, Judy Hubbard, I remember, who won a purse, and she said, if I had two of these, I could wear them as earrings. At any rate, we got together as coaches and we formed the Northern California High School Speech Association. Now, John Fanuki was a coach from Stockton Junior, Co high, junior Co high School. No, excuse me, Junior College. It was a four-year institution going from the 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th years. So he was part high school, part junior college. He was elected president and I was elected secretary treasurer. That was 1952. The following fall, we called a meeting down in Fresno and coaches from the South, some of them uh, met us, and we began to develop means of taking over the state qualifying tournament. We decided on the events we were going to offer, we decided on the rules, we decided on the the time, and furthermore, we disseminated all this information early and to everybody. Now, it's true that we also were going to have a hand in running that state tournament when we got there. So, since we were going to alternate north and south, the first time this happened fell to me as the secretary treasurer. For some reason, I was selected from the north to run, help run the state tournament. That was 1953. I did all the groundwork. I had all the ballots uh, printed. I got out all the information. I handled all the preliminaries that were necessary for that state qualifying tournament. 
It was held at Santa Barbara, the University of California, Santa Barbara, in the old campus that was right inside Santa Barbara proper. And Dr. Upton Palmer was the head of forensics at that time. He was somebody that I knew from way back. I had known him when I was a, a student in college and he was at a, a rival school coaching. Well, he took over the running of it and I sat outside while his minions were inside again. Secrecy, secrecy, which is one of the things I hated about the way the NFL had been run up north. So the scheduling, the tallying, the judging, everything went on behind closed doors and I didn't know anything about it, although I'd done all the preliminary work. So this was not satisfactory either. So eventually, we kept working towards this business of having our own California High School Speech Association. It took us five years, from 1952, when we first formed the Northern California High School Speech Association, until 1957, in the spring, at the state tournament, we finally got around to the formal organization and Edna Speltz from Downey High School was elected the first president. How did the colleges take it when you took away their money cow? Because after all, they were running those tournaments for their own benefit, right? I don't really recall, but they didn't have a lot to say about it. And it's interesting because I guess they took it rather well because we still had uh, our qualifying tournaments at COP and they ran them according to the way we wanted them run. And I mentioned earlier that there was too much secrecy and there was all this business behind closed doors. I remember my first NFL district meeting in, in San Francisco and nobody except the small crew inside knew what was going on. Super, super secret. And I was opposed to that. So one of the things that I did do was open up things so that everybody knew what was going on and everybody got put to work, I might add. I'm sure they're all grateful for that. So in other words, you had a lot of trouble when you first got there with the, uh, the way the tournaments were run. Um, were there any other things you had to worry about at Modesto High School itself? Well, yes. As I said, I had a very, very small nucleus of a squad. And I had heard from various people that the procedure that Margaret Painter had uh, was to go into the office and to check through the files and pick out the people with the highest IQs and invite them to come into Speaker's Bureau. So she always had a very small group of very, very, very smart people. But I opened it up to just about everybody. I had public speaking classes at the time, I think three of them, and I recruited a great many people from those public speaking classes. Now one of the things that happened in the early years was that um, the, the procedure had been to make the English teachers, the whole English department, help run the tournament. They were running the events. So that they were stuck there all day long, you see, doing the scheduling and the tallying and the whole business. And when I started having two tournaments a year, as I did the second year I was there, they began to protest a little bit. And I personally thought they would be better off if they were judging instead of trying to run a, a speech event. So one of the things that we did after we formed the Northern California High School Speech Association was to make some plans to have the students of a school who was hosting a tournament run the events. And that meant that I worked out, again, voluminous instructions about how to go about doing the scheduling so that it would be fair and so you gave people different speaking positions and succeeding rounds and how you tallied things and how you did all these things. Then you trained your own students to run this, but of course they couldn't participate in your own tournament. We did this for a couple of years and finally we decided that since the same schools were always offering the tournaments and thus the same schools were having to penalize their own students because they were running the tournament that we would try something else. And it was at that stage, I believe, that I decided that the coaches should be the ones in the event rooms, running the events, 
making out the ballots, tallying the results, keeping score, putting out the results. And that's when I really put them to work. And from then on, that's the way we worked it. And again, that took away the secrecy that had been such a bane of our existence. Now this went on then for four years for the Northern California High School Speech Association. And we had been very active in recruiting schools who were north of the Tehachapi's that I remember, uh, from the coast clear over to the valley and up north to Sacramento. And we had gained so many participants, gotten so large and unwieldy, that at the end of four years, we split east and west into the coast league and into the valley forensic league. And then my recollection is that that only lasted two years and we split again north and south both places. And in our case, in my case, the northern half of our Valley Forensic League became the Yosemite Forensic League and the southern half became the Southern Valley Forensic League. Went down to Bakersfield and Fresno and uh, I believe, I can't remember right now at the moment whether Fresno was with us or in the, with the south. I think it was with the South probably. We went up north as far as Sacramento and over into the Sierra Nevada foothills. The thing that confuses me is that I seem to have lost a year in here somewhere because I would have said that it was four years for the Northern California High School Speech Association, two years for the Central Valley, and then the Yosemite Forensic League was formed. As far as I know, it's still going strong. I don't know I've been gone so long. <laughs> At any rate, things improved as we went along because we had refinement of the rules, refinement of everything, refinement of how we ran things, and all the coaches knew how to do just about everything and were always willing to do so. So in the long run, we had a much more efficiently run tournament. We had more people involved all the time, and it was a very happy camper sort of thing. And I think maybe we better pause here for me to get breath. You can back up. That's the only time in my memory you've ever run out of breath. Um, why don't you give us a little bit of a summary of some of the offices that you held in this evolving organization? Well, since my memory is so poor these days, and although I've been studying this material now for several months, I think I have to rely on a paper I have here that I found in my files. It says that in 1953-54, I was the secretary treasurer of the Northern California High School Speech Association. In 1954-55, I was the president. And my daughter says, I'm not looking in the damn camera. Well, here we go again. The Yosemite Forensic League, when it uh, started, I was the president for two years, once 1960 to 1962, and believe it or not, many years later, 1972 to 74, I was the vice president. I think they were desperate that year, I remember. Then, um, the Northern California National Forensic League District, I was the district chairman in 1954, 1955, and 1955-56, but I was also a member of the district committee for at least another four years in there. In the Central California NFL, which I failed to mention so far, uh, was formed when we split the Northern California NFL into two parts, east and west, and we became the Central California NFL. I was the district chairman in 1958-59 and a member of the committee for at least two other years. As far as the California State Speech Council went, <clears throat> in 1958-59, I was the secretary treasurer. In 1961-62, I was the president. And I was a member of that State Speech Council for many years. And the year that I wrote this, I think, was 1967, and it said I had been a member for the nine years that it has been functioning. And after that, I really don't remember how many times I was on that, that uh, council. The North Central California Speech Conference area was something that grew out of the California speech, uh, high school speech conference area. 
And I was the president of that, I see, 1964-65, 1965-66, and I represented that group on the council in 1967-68. Now, I wouldn't have remembered much of that at all, frankly. Uh, the Western Speech Association, which I also belong to, I was the vice president of the Central California section, 1955-56, and I served on an ad hoc committee on the speech for secondary schools for a period of three years, I think it was 1957 through 1958-59. The other thing that I belonged to nationally was the Speech Association of America. I know these have all changed names now, but uh, the subsection for high school discussion on debate and interest group, I was involved with that, and I was the secretary of it for a period of three years. I think that about covers that. Now, if you want to know something about what the other coaches were doing. Yes, tell us a little bit about some of the other coaches you were working with. Well, Joe Lagnes was from Sweetwater down in the San Diego area, and he was the president of the State Speech Council the year that I was the secretary treasurer. And that was the s second year of its being. Uh, as far as I can remember, Carmen Del Fernandez was the third president. For the life of me, I have not been able to recall who was the fourth one. We were alternating north and south still on that. And the fifth one was yours truly. Now, other people from that area were Day Hanks, who was there when I first arrived, Anton Haglin from Alhambra. Day Hanks was from uh, Marshall High School in Los Angeles. Milt Dobkin was there to begin with, but he moved shortly thereafter up to a brand new school that was starting, Humboldt State. In uh, Bakersfield, I remember Florence Goltz. Uh, interesting story about her many years after I'd ceased to see her because we didn't meet much. I met her on a train in West Germany in 1976. Then uh, in the north, I've already mentioned Betty Perkins, who unfortunately died in February of 1959 just about five days after she had run a big tournament. She was a very good friend of mine, and we missed her a great deal. I've mentioned Carm, I've mentioned, uh, oh, I haven't Tell about Betty's. I have mentioned Edna Speltz, and she came to Downey, and as I remember, 1952, it was a brand new school. Uh, who else were you talking about? Um, Betty Perkins and her moo-moo. No, it wasn't Betty Perkins in her moo, moo. it was Carmen Del Fernandez. Oh. She'd been uh. in Hawaii and at the state tournament one year. She was giving us a blow-by-blow -blow account of her judging of a WCTU speech tournament. It was hilarious. She had us rolling in the aisles. I now, think for those you better youngsters, translate WCTU. Yeah, the youngsters who don't know what WCTU meant, it was the wish the Women's Christian Temperance Union, the people who were instrumental in getting that prohibition in that I was talking about way back in 1931. <laughs> well, let's see. There were a lot of others. There were a lot of Catholic brothers. There were people at Bellarmine Prep, St. Ignatius in San Francisco. There was a, a Christian Brothers School down in Fresno, a great fellow there. There was a, a fellow up in Sacramento with a Christian school, a brother's school. But, you know, I've racked my brain. I cannot remember any except one of them, and that was a fellow named Weber, who was over, I think, in Bellarmine. And in 1955, when I was district chairman and we had the National NFL Speech Tournament in that area, he and another Catholic brother, probably from St. Ignatius, drove two of the buses that <clears throat> took visitors down to Santa Cruz. Now, these two gentlemen were dressed in their black trousers, but they had on very wild, colorful shirts. And at the Santa Cruz destination, I was approached by a woman who was incensed to see a Catholic nun talking to those two strange men. I wanted to say, well, for your information, those are a couple of Catholic brothers, 
But I thought, well, maybe I had better do that. So I simply explained that this was a national speech tournament. We had visitors from all over the United States, and these were not strangers that the Catholic nun was talking to. <laughs> uh, Weber is a name of a... Didn't Carmen Del Fernandez have a friend Oh, that was someone Weber? who came, yes, who came later, happened to have the same last name, and that was Nan Weber, who was also from the same area in Sunnyvale. <laughs> and who was also very, very uh, instrumental in some of these early years. And there were others, you know, who came along, uh, after all, Donovan Cummings and, uh, and uh, uh, Jerry Rogers and Marion Milgren were there in the Stockton area. I remember when the three of them came down to Modesto and had dinner with with Edna Speltz and me, and we talked about tournaments and all of that sort of jazz. And that was probably, oh, I don't know, in the early 60s, somewhere in there. I remember Edna Speltz at the uh, national tournament in Florida in the uh, spring of 1958. No, that wouldn't have been 58. It would be uh, 1960. 59. Then. 59. 1959. You had just graduated. She got from the world's worst sunburn. Oh, we had to walk miles across campus at the University of Miami to judge, and she just turned red as a beet. I had never seen anybody get sunburned as fast as she did, and she was in real misery. Any other memories about her? Well, we became good friends, obviously. Worked very closely together. I, I do have some stories that go back to what happened at the University of uh, San Francisco when we were running NFL qualifying tournaments. I have to say that in 1956, when I was district chairman, I had probably the worst experience of my whole career. And that was because I was having to run it from Modesto and having to rely on a Father Egan at the University of San Francisco to get the judges for the tournament. I did all the other work that was involved, but he was supposed to get the judges. And I would call him at regular intervals, and he would assure me that I had nothing, absolutely nothing to worry about. <laughs> well, we got there, and we are ready to start the first round, and there were exactly three judges, and Father Egan had not put in an appearance at all. In fact, he did not put in an appearance for the whole two days of the tournament. <laughs> but the students who had been high school debaters who were on, <coughs> excuse me, on the squad there at uh, the University of San Francisco went all out to try to get judges for us. They even, they called everybody they knew they went out on the street, believe me or not, uh, or not, and actually dragged people in off the street. We had so much time for the extempers to get ready, they could have written an original oration by the time we found three judges who could judge the panel. And as a result of this fiasco, we were running, we were finishing the last round of extemp at two in the morning. Now, one of my best debaters happened to be a finalist in Girls Extemp. So you can imagine what that did to that debate team the next day. But at any rate, Edna Speltz and Betty Perkins and I were apparently the committee. We got down to the hotel at 3 o'clock in the morning and had to get up again at 6 o'clock to get back up there, hoping that we would have more judges the second day and it went on until midnight, of course, and we finally finished. And then, and only then, did my students and my bus driver tell me that we had lost a student, that they had been looking for him all over San Francisco, and consequently, 
We went down, the last lady that he'd been heard of was down on market somewhere. So we went down there and I spotted him. This is midnight. I spotted him on the street. I got out of the bus. I went over and he thought that the Gestapo had hit him. He was a German foreign exchange student. So that was one of the interesting things that happened. So were there other problems at San Francisco University in other years? Yes, there were. At, after that 1956 fiasco, I said that uh, I would not be district chairman and be responsible for having it there again. And um, I think Edna took over at that time. But in 1957, she, she asked if we couldn't go down the day ahead, the two of us were obviously on the committee, I remember the third one was probably CARM, and get down there early and take care of things. So we did that, and our two assistants, <laughs> we were really riding high in those days, she had one and I had one, uh, were going to bring the students down. Well, there we were, the day of the tournament, everything going along swimmingly, except that our bus had not arrived. Downey and Modesto were riding together, and something had delayed them. Consequently, here we were, the people running the tournament, and our students weren't there to participate. That was really horrendous. They missed the whole first round, as I recall. And I think that uh, having had a meeting of all the coaches, they decided that what we would do would just give them all last place as if they had participated and go on from there. I uh, remember this because Dan McCall was one of these students and he was one of my top students and it was his last year he managed to recover the trauma of the first round but I'm not sure anybody else did well the next year 1958 it must have been we were there busy running a tournament again it was late at night I think the finals of debate were going on upstairs and I had been upstairs on the second floor perhaps checking on it and I came down the stairs and there was Edna standing there gesturing furiously to try to get me to not to say anything, obviously, because something was going on down there. And we had a crazy janitor who was ranting and raving and carrying on and saying that someone had broken a toilet in the women's restroom. Well, I went on down and had a look, and there wasn't a thing wrong with the women's restroom. Nothing was broken. Well, a few minutes later, this crazy janitor turned off all the lights in the building. So there was the final debate going on upstairs in the dark, mind you. <laughs> all of us in the dark. We finally sent somebody out to get a hold of one of the administrators at the school who came back over and took control and we got the lights back on. That was the last year that we were at USF as far as I was concerned for the NFL district tournament. Was it your experiences at that place as well that also prompted you to make some changes in oh, uh, the way Extemp was run? Well, yes. Well, I did want to say, though, that we, we split the district then, uh, that year, 1958. And from then on, 58, 59, and so on, we were the Central California NFL over in the Valley area. Well, yes, the way they ran Extemp at NFL was really ridiculous. They had, in, those, in the early days, they had hundreds of individual topics laid out on a table, upside down of course, and a student would come up and he would pick three topics at random off this table. He might get three good ones, he might get one good one, he might get no good ones, and then he would have to select one, turn it back in, turn the others back in, and then report to someone as to which topic he had chosen. So this was time consuming, it was unfair as far as the selection of the topics was concerned, and I thought something had to be done about that. So somewhere along the way, and I don't really remember exactly when, I came up with the idea of concentrating on a few good topics and just phrasing them in different ways. In other words, if there were a very good area, let's say, on something to do with the uh, British or French relationships, and you could phrase it maybe four or five different ways to get different slants on it, then we would take these good topics and only the good topics, and we would get several good topics out of it. Well, 
we had uh, separated them into an international round, a national round, and a general round. And before, they were all mixed in. It was a mishmash of things. And then, this way, you could have it all typed up ahead of time. Student drew uh, the three at one time, and handed a, a slip of paper, and had three topics on it. He looked at it, decided which one he went, wanted, came back and told you. And you simply circled on a master sheet that he'd checked, taken. He was speaker number one, he'd taken topic number three. So that you had a master copy immediately. In fact, you could have as many copies by using carbon as you wanted. And you could send them off to the judges just as soon as everybody had drawn their topics. That way, the judges had in hand the subjects that had been chosen, so a student couldn't switch to something else if he wanted to. And uh, the whole thing went much more smoothly. It meant a lot of work ahead of time, trying to be very fair about these topics and phrasing them well. But it was a real time saver as far as running the tournament was concerned. So then you're saying that in 1958, um, they split the district again, and you became, you went back to being whatever the district chairman the district chairman we we split the district that year and i went back to being district chairman so that there were two nfl districts in northern california at that time and there were four others that were the product the subdivision of the original northern california high school speech association all in all there were six different leagues and there had only been one eight years earlier and in addition to that we already had the state going. And when you split the league, then did you hold, the, you didn't hold them at, in San Francisco anymore, which was great. Where did you hold that tournament the first year you had it? We had it at Majesto Junior College, mm -hmm. and it went rather well, except that someone reported to me that there was a crazy student running around the campus, well, walking around the campus, talking to himself and gesturing. We explained that it was probably a student practicing his extent topic. And the security arrested him already? The security stopped him, yes. I <laughs> thought they had a crazy boy on their hands. <laughs> we had uh, a girl, Sonia Johnson, who took first in dramatic that year, and she went to the Nationals in Miami, and the thing about her was that she got this terrible tooth infection. Her whole face was all swollen up, but she managed to last, as I remember, into the quarterfinals. <laughs> Why don't you tell us about, um, in general, some of the achievements of your students over the years? Well, again, I have reference to a sheet of paper that I made out back in 1967, in which I've tried to update a bit. It didn't take a lot of updating, actually, because of the nature of the situation in Modesto, when I went there, there was only one high school. And then along came Downey, and then along came a Catholic high school, and then along came Grace Davis High School, and then along came Byer. And by that time, there wasn't much left for Modesto High School. We were the poor social economic uh, district. And when I left, I think there were as many as 50% of those students who couldn't read it at the, like the fourth grade level. So I only had um, a very limited access to really talented students. I still had a squad. We had no hopes of ever winning much of anything, but we definitely had gone downhill. But this uh, little paper I have here that I made out in 1967 apparently shows that uh, we had a total of, I had a total of 17 students who qualified during the 26 years I was at Modesto High School to go to 12 different national speech tournaments and or congresses. Now we didn't get to all of them. Uh, on one occasion the student had won so many other things that he had conflicts going back to the state, uh, to the Hmm, I guess it was a model UN and the national tournament and he had been to the national tournament the year before and had placed I guess first in dramatics placed first in something anyway <laughs> and 
And so he elected not to go. That was 1957. And then in 1966, I had a girl who should have gone in oratory. She had gone the year before and had done well in dramatic and chirp, and she elected just not to go. So there was a long dry spell in there until 1974, two years before I retired, when I had a boy in Boise Stamp. And since I was going to Europe with my kids, Susan and Bob, uh, the other... Okay, you were going to tell us a little something about some of the individual students that you remember? Well, again, I've referred to this list that I brought with me when I retired of the NFL membership. I should say that that first year that I was at Modesto High School, I added 30 more people to the rosters uh, so that we wound up at the end of the year with 34 instead of 4. And uh, running down the list here, and the graduates that year, Tom Shepard, who was one of the mighty four that I inherited, has been a lawyer for many, many years in Stockton, California, and I suppose by this time he may have retired. In uh, 1952, one of the ones I remember is Carl Henderson. I remember him because he lived with his widowed mother some distance out of town. And if he st we had a debate meeting at my house at, uh, in the evening, he would have to stay in town, miss the bus. He'd go to the library, hang around there, I suppose studying, and then when the time came, he'd walk clear out to my place and he'd head for the refrigerator first thing he came in the house. We fed, we fed Carl a lot. And then afterwards, I'm assuming that some one of the students probably gave him a ride home. I hope so. He was a tall, lanky guy. He could eat a lot. He could eat a lot. Oh, he didn't compare with Bruce Nickerson a few years later. But I will say this, that he won a small scholarship. In those days, they weren't very big, to go to UC at Cal. And he wasn't able to stay there because he just couldn't afford it. And he went on, and he was a highway patrolman long enough to retire. And after he retired, he finally got away and got to law school. And the last I heard, he's a lawyer down in Fresno. Good power. Now, in 1952, Joan McCormick was a student who went to the National, well, she went to the National in 1951. She graduated in 52. She went to the one down at Pepperdine, L.A., and Carl went to the Nationals in Boston all by himself. In those days, I guess they didn't care whether the coach came along or not. He went to the first student congress that they had. Well, to move on, uh, in 1953, there were two who graduated, John Hardy and Ed Gray, who were quite a twosome. They, they came into the competitive speech program as juniors, and I think they didn't do any debating until their senior year. They went down to a tournament, may have been held at St. Ignatius, I think, in the Bay Area. And they were in the beginner's division, and they won. So I kept trying to reduce the size of their swelled heads by saying that, well, they had to move up to the advanced section the next time out, and they were going to get clobbered. Well, they fooled me. They didn't get clobbered. They won again. So they were practically uh, <laughs> uh, impossible to keep down. The thing I remember about Ed Gray is that many years later, he was the national bank examiner that brought down the Keating Five, if you remember that little business. Uh, to go on, um, oh, Alec Joseph, who graduated in 1954, was a real character. And as a matter of fact, I don't know what he did, but he did something at a tournament at Downey, and he was in the finals, supposed to be in the finals for state, qualifying tournament, and he did something and I yanked him out of the finals. And he quit school the next day and joined the Army, as I recall. Many years later, he was on the police force in Modesto, and he used to meet the bus when he'd come home, and the students would say, Mr. Ritter, there's a police car out here, and of course it would be <laughs> this character. Well, some years later, I heard that he had become a Mormon, and he was living someplace in Utah, and he has any number of wives. He's become quite famous. He's been on TV as a result of this exposure. Now, the next year, around 56, Ross Sargent was one of my top people. 
he uh, was actually in the finals of debate his junior year at State. He was a lawyer, and he's been a lawyer there in Stockton for a great many years. And then uh, the famous team of Eleanor Simmons and Janet Dollar, who didn't do so well at that infamous 1956 district tournament where we didn't have enough judges and Janet was in the finals of girls extemp until two in the morning and then tried to debate the next day. Now I'm going to drop down to 1957 with Dan McCall because if anybody won a lot of things it was Dan McCall and I should have mentioned that I, I've just checked and he did take first in dramatic in the nationals in 1956 but among other things that he did he won the American Legion Oratory Contest. He was first in the nation. He won the California Nevada Alliance Club Oratory Contest. He was first. Native Sons of the Golden West, first in the state. And he won the United Nations Pilgrimage. He was the state winner and won a trip to the United Nations. And he won the Alexander Hamilton Oratory Contest. He was winner of a top national award of $2,000 scholarship. So in addition to that, he won a great many times at state. He paired with Ross Sargent as a, he was a sophomore at the time in the finals of debate at state. And he won first in every event that he could enter, except the one I wouldn't let him enter, which was oratorical in Turk his senior year. And he thought he should get into that, and he probably could have won it, but I wouldn't let him go. I thought it was a beginner's event, that's why. And what's become of him since? He's at Cornell Oh, he's University. been a, a full professor, I guess, at Cornell for a number of years now, and is a recognized author, so he's done well. And I met him a few years ago. That's right, you met him. And um, despite the fact that he was always a bit of a pain when he was your student because he had a swelled head, he said to tell you that you were the best thing that ever happened to him. Oh, well, I'm glad to hear that, because yeah. <laughs> I did give him a bad time, I'm afraid. <laughs> now, uh, Bruce Nickerson, uh, you talk about someone who could eat a lot. Bruce was the one that I remember. We went to a model United Nations at the Cal campus in Berkeley. And we, st we stopped for breakfast. He had an enormous breakfast. I mean, he had like three breakfasts, you might say. St he had breakfast cereal, hot breakfast cereal. He had bacon and eggs, you know, he had all this. And then he went out and bought a dozen donuts and he wouldn't share them with anybody. <laughs> but he and James Reed were the last debate team, I think, that I took to state. And en route, we stopped at San Luis Obispo to have lunch. Now we were traveling with the Downey team and Edna and my students ate the wrong thing, obviously, and they were all just terribly ill all night long. And as a result, my debate team could hardly get through the day. <laughs> and Edna had a little trouble herself. And that was her year as uh, president of the, of the California High School Speech Association. Now, um, I remember James Carter from 1959 not so much about what he did when he was in school, but four years later, five years later, 1963, I get this call from James Carter, who has just returned from Okinawa. He has acquired an Okinawan wife and a stepchild. He doesn't know where he's going to plant them for a few days. Would I please take them in? And, of course, I did. I took them in. Now, to move on, let's see, I've got... Oh, let's see. Hmm. I don't know. I must not have marked this page. 1960. Can't seem to find anybody that I should mention. There surely should be some, but who knows. Cressy Nakagawa? No, Cressy was 61. He's coming up. Ba, um, this is Joe Sims. Joe Sims. Joe Sims, who Joe was Sims. a black student I had who was almost blind, but he was a very intelligent boy and he did a beautiful job. Later his younger brother Lewis was on the squad and he did very well too. I might say that I had many family members. There were any number where I had two from a family, three from a family, four from a family, and uh, that's the way it went over the years. Now I have uh, <coughs> 
Kresi Nakagawa, who Susan was mentioning a moment ago, he went to nationals, and so did Kathleen Miller, who was his debate colleague. Well, they went to state in debate, so I'm wrong. 61 was the last time I had somebody in debate, I guess, at state. And they uh, went to the nationals, however. Cressy went in Boise Stamp, and Kathleen went in Student Congress. Cressy has been a lawyer in San Francisco for a number of years. Kathleen got married, I guess more than once, used to come and judge for me. <laughs> um, Dimery Nelson, who was in the finals of the Girls' Extemp in 1962. That was the year that I was the president of the California High School Speech Association and was running the tournament. And now we get down to... Oh, Dimery was my debate partner, too. Dimery was Susan's debate partner, and they were she very good She got me team. in trouble more times than once. <laughs> she got you in trouble that year, I know. Yes. Yes. Now, shall we tell that story? No, I don't think we'll tell that okay. story. All right, Susan, of course, graduated in 63. She was one of my top students. She went to Nationals in 1962. You want to tell them the story about how I got there? Well, I'll let you tell that one. <laughs> how about that? <laughs> well, from behind the camera then. <laughs> it was in Student Congress and... Um, this was in Fresno, I and, think. Yes, Fresno. And I had already, I guess, uh, one, one outstanding speaker. And since, as a child, I had... Um, had gone to numerous nationals, uh, tagged along, and my friend was also uh, nominated. Uh, I stood up and said I would forego uh, being considered for nationals in favor of Dan. The fellow who was running the uh, event sent a note immediately off to my mother, whose face so it appeared in a small square that was in the doorway to the room, and it was red with rage, at which point I stood up and said, hell hath no fury like a mother scorned, and could I please reconsider my rescinding? And I, I was then elected to go to nationals, which was a great time because I was the only girl in the Senate. <laughs> Even if it was in Missoula, In Missoula, Montana. Montana. Right. <laughs> Not too great. Uh -uh. Well, I had a lot of good people that year, actually. And uh, in the following year, I also had a great many that were very, very good, including my son, Robert. And Robert Rose, who unfortunately was killed at a very young age uh, in a boating accident on the Sacramento River. And Rademacher, John Rademacher, who went off to the... West Point, and then Brent Young, who graduated the following year, whose father, by the way, would have played Hop Singh in that Western movie. Bonanza. Bonanza. His father was in Bonanza. Well, Brent Young has wound up being a teacher of glass making and a creator of glass. And he's very, very successful. He's been in Cleveland, Ohio for a good many years. Then I guess I'm going to drop down here to Vera Sadkowski, who went to nationals in 1965 and did extremely well in Dramatic and Turk. She won the right to go in original oratory in 1966, but elected not to go. And this was a an era, if you remember, of hate Ashbury and all the problems that young people were having, and unfortunately, she fell into some of those difficulties. Um, hmm. Oh, we're down, uh, way down here in the 1968, and there's somebody here named Charlotte Ferreira, whom you may know, because I understand that she's at Modesto High School now. And she's either the debate coach or the drama teacher. I'm not sure which. I keep getting confused with her sister Barbara, whom I had a couple of years later. So they're both there, former students of mine, handling the forensics and the drama at Modesto High School. That is the last I knew. That's the situation. And I'm dropping down again rather quickly to a young girl named Mary Bavaris, 
who graduated in 1969, had some good people then too, still had some good people, and she wound up going to England, getting married, going to England after having obtained a master's degree from John Hopkins, I believe, in the East. And while I was there in London, after I had retired in 1976 and was so ill, she came by to see me before I took the plane home. And she kept in touch with me for quite a number of years, as have others. Uh, one uh, from 1954, who uh, Evelyn Griswold used to call, even called me since I moved here to Arizona on my birthday and say, and saying, uh, I don't have it written down, but I believe today is your birthday. Happy birthday. Actually, though, I haven't heard from anybody much in the last three years. I think things are sort of dwindling away, you know, and most of them have got their own families and they're terribly busy and they don't keep up anymore. Well, let's see. Well, there's I mentioned so many Barbara. left out. I mean, mm -hmm. there's so many. I've left out a lot. Yeah, none of the Walthers, the I, three oh, Walthers. That, the year that you were there, there was a, a whole bundle of great ones. Yeah. Trudy Van Kenheimer, yeah. Nyenberg, and, and Dan Walther, and, and uh, every year there have been others. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm clear down to 1972 now with uh, Ken Adair, Frank Carson, and the following year, Mike Nakagawa, who was the younger brother of Cressy. Uh, those three were really a, a trio. They came by one time on my birthday in Modesto, arrived at the door. I believe they had, I don't know if they had a birthday cake or flowers or what, came in and said, well, there was going to be a delivery because they had ordered a bottle of wine or something, but they wouldn't let them bring it to me. They were having it delivered. <laughs> but I can remember when Mike and Frank would leave my apartment and they go ramming down the stairs yelling, I told you not to hit her again. And I said, my God, someday these old ladies in these other apartments are going to call the police because they think you're beating up your coach. Well, they were just a bunch of nuts is what it was. <clears throat> well, Oliver McMahon was from 72. He was a big football player, part Hawaiian and part Scott. And one time when I was in New York City, he called on Thanksgiving Day, told me he was an assistant dean at a private boys' school in North Dakota, and he just thought he would call me on Thanksgiving and thank me. And well, I thought that was very nice. Well, where are we here? I got Mike Nakagawa in there. Mm -hmm. All right, I think we've about done it. No, here's another page. Terry McHale was the last one that I qualified to go to nationals, and he graduated in 1974. The year before that, Helen Caswell, no, the same year, Helen Caswell graduated. She wrote me a very nice letter after she and Frank and another student had gotten together to watch some program that they, uh, t that I had produced, or had been in, in New York City and they were congratulating me on my acting career, saying how happy they were that I was off doing these things. I think I've about had it. Oh, I was going to mention one more, and that's Brian Tibbetts. And I mentioned him principally because when he walked into my classroom, he said to me, you know, you had my father <laughs> as a student. I said, I did. Well, this, uh, he graduated, Brian graduated in 75, and I retired in 76. I thought it was about time. There's one other thing you might mention, and that is that over the years, most of your students, the ones who were on your squad, stayed there, all called you Ma. Oh, yes. And that there were more occasions than I can count, in which that confused people in public. That's such a large and motley crew, <laughs> all referring to you as Ma in restaurants and other places. Oh yes, Anton Hagman, <laughs> that I mentioned earlier oh, at Ripon one time. It was when you and uh, Bob were very small, and for some reason, I had to take you along that day. So of course, you I had said you were my children, but then some of my students were coming in and saying Ma, and finally Anton said, 
How many children do you have? <laughs> Funny part of that is that the first year I taught, my students called me Ma. And when I was in Sioux Falls, my name, of course, was Strahan, and there was this one guy that called me Stray Honey. And then when I got out to Hermiston, Oregon, after I'd been in the Army, I'd been a captain, but this one student always referred to me as General. <laughs> so I've had a lot of names. That I Sarge, guess. too. Oh, and the Spelts always called me Sarge. Sarge. And of course, a lot of people felt that that was my name. I can't imagine. Uh, it reminds me of one other story about Carm. She had a bet on $10 one time at a state speech tournament. She said, I, I'll tell you exactly what Mary will say when I nag her to hurry up. And she won the bet because I said, damn it, I'll come when I'm good and ready. <laughs> I understand you about something that happened at state tournament. Well, you know, I'm always putting people to work. If I see an idle hand, I don't want it to stay idle. So one year at the state speech tournament, it was probably one of the early years, either when Edna was president or the next year when Joe Lagnese was president and I was uh, secretary treasurer. At any rate, into the headquarters came a covey of people whom I did not know. And they were standing around uh, sort of observing things going on and we were frantically trying to get all these certificates ready that we gave to the students at the end of the tournament. And we had a seal that was put on with ribbons underneath it indicating first place, second place, so on. And then it was imprinted with the state seal, which Edna had prepared. So I said to these people, well, you don't seem to be doing anything. Would you like to sit down here and help us put these ribbons and seals on these certificates? I'm sure they didn't know what to say, but they sat down and they did it. I found out later that they were fellow professors of Dr. Palmer. <laughs> and now I'm going to have her hold up a picture of herself at the age when she was 21 21 and a college debater just to show you the variance in time you wish me to keep holding this that's fine now you can put it down all right the next item she's holding up is a portrait of her when uh, that I did when she was modeling for my students recently in art class. So she keeps busy. And uh, the photographer would now like to apologize for any variance in color and sound quality and well, cat noises. I'd like to apologize for all the glitzes and all the garbage, but it's the best we could do, and it's getting on to 1 o'clock in the morning, and this old lady is tired. <laughs> so, Donovan, we're going to sign off now. We hope this is satisfactory.